And I'm gonna that's why I have some questions. Sorry. Sorry. I am trying to conclude all. As you said for Musa and the and the Nabi Musa Salamullah, I will try to increase the discussion time with you. Yeah, to get more to get more knowledge and lighting as you say, Alhamdulillah. You blessed in the month of Ramadan we got opportunity. I'm really thankful to Sheikh Jihad for giving us time for our youth and community in these days. And thanks to all of you for participating and especially our youth here. And all those who are watching us online, also they can send questions to Brother Romy or myself or other email addresses which already mentioned. Some questions, Bill, I am today a handful of questions, but I'll try to ask some useful questions for you and others, inshallah. Because as Imam Ali alayhi salatu wa salam say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Question is the sign of seeker. And inshallah, if you continue a student within you, seeking within you, you will get lessons from anything around you. So first question is, as per your discussions, share how to control our anger and keep piety, especially at the time of arguments. You are the water. No, no, please. Bismillah <laughs> <laughs> ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi al-Tayyibin al-Tahiri. Firstly, we must know what entails anger. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has alluded to this and he said, in fact, there is a hadith that says the Prophet was among his companions and said uh, once and he asked him, Atadruna man is sari'a? Do you know who is a good wrestler? So they said, Man yada'u aw yasa'u al-rijala ila al-ard. You know, those people were thinking with muscles. Rasulullah wanted them to think with their intellect. So they said, a wrestler is the one that put peoples to the ground. Rasulullah said, no. A real wrestler is someone who has control over himself when he's angered. That's a real wrestler. When you wrestle internally in order to subdue your anger at a time of argument. Secondly, what you need to know is, is the argument personal or is it about something that relates to Allah, the Prophet, the Imams, the religion? If it is something that violates the law of Allah, then it's a different argument and you take a different approach. And even in that, right, in that, you must maintain a state of calmness in order to convey the message across to the person arguing with you about this particular issue because the Quran says, you know, uh, 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 in terms of, of uh, 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 argument, he says to the Prophet, وَجَادِلُهُمْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنُ When you argue with someone in regard to something that may bring a heated discussion in place, so Ya Rasulullah, Ya Muhammad, debate them, argue with them, discuss with them with what is best. Because that could give the message in a more clearer form for the opponent to understand your discussion or your argument. If the argument is for something other than this, you should not even be concerned. You know, if it is about the world, if it's about a car, my car is better than yours. Congratulations. <laughs> congratulations. My house is bigger than yours. A thousand congratulations. You know, what, how is this going to affect me? You know, I am smarter than you. Mubarak. You know, my father is better than your father. Habibi, everyone knows he's dad. End of the story. Ahsan, right? For example, in another uh, uh, argument, someone came to infuriate Imam al-Baqir. 
This is Wallah al Adim. When I hear this hadith and I speak about it, shivers comes down my spine. My hair stands on end. Because he came to humiliate Imam al Baqir. You know, the first question he said, he came to him and he said, Aanta al ladina yaddaoon annahu al Baqara? Allahu Akbar. Because he's al Baqir. Right? So from al Baqir, the word Baqar is derived, or Baqara. Or Baqara has a dual meaning. It could be something that means a cow, or it could mean the one that splits the knowledge apart and goes to the deepest end in order to extrapolate a law. يَسْتَنْبَطُ الْحُكْمُ مِنَ الْعِلْمُ Right? فَهِ يَبْكُرُ الْعِلْمُ بَقْرَ يعني He goes to the deep, he splits it in order to give you the answer. قَالَ نَعَمْ أَنَا الَّذِينَ يُسَمُّونَنِ الْبَاقِرَ الَّذِي يَبْكُرُ الْعِلْمَ بَقْرَ He didn't take offense, he said, How dare you call me a cow? Right? Then he said to him, You are the one, the son of a lady that works as a chef, يعني she cooks. قَالَ تِلْكَ هِيَ مِهْنَتُهَا الله الله that's her profession الله أكبر so what if she cooks if she cooks is that something that is bad about her character huh he said أنت ابن الطباخة he said yeah تلك مهنتها that's her profession سبحان الله he did not rebut the argument by saying for example and you are the son of so and so he could have صلوات الله وسلام عليه but his akhlaq and his religiousness and his demeanor and his character wants to teach that person akhlaq in the midst of the argument, in the midst of humiliation. You know, when you argue with someone that is heralding abuse at you and you are only showing him love, what would be the expectation on the part of the person you are arguing with him except to acknowledge your character, right? What did he say to the Imam at the end? He said, Allahu ya'lamu haythu yaj'alu risalata. Only Allah knows where he puts his message. And surely you are from the progeny of Anbiya. Allahu Akbar. So this is our approach towards staying calm, changing your position. Right, Mawlan? Huh? If you don't, if you get too angry, go and make wudu. These are the things. Imam Ali says, if you are arguing and you get angry with someone and you're standing up, sit down. If you're sitting down, lie on your side. Don't allow anger to overcome you. And in that way, by putting this into practice, we can inshallah achieve some sort of control of ourselves. Sorry. Sir, and if it's still wuzu cannot control, you can do, Ahsan. do, do ghusl like Ahsan. that. And, and, well. and if you have a pool, jump in the pool. Jump in the pool. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Ahsan. Ahsan. We have to make pool. Ahsan. Yes, yeah, yeah. you can go to the other house. Don't mind. Okay, one more thing. Uh, Sheikh, how to increase our attention and soulfulness in our daily prayer Ahsan. and other worships Ahsan. in our routine life? Ahsant, Ahsant. You know, Salah, as I said, is a medium where we find that particular attachment and solace to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the first approach of entering into Salah is that I don't have to do it, I want to do it. Two different approaches. There is nothing you have to do. It must be on the medium that you want to do it. Once you develop that internal introspective, uh, introspective thinking that you want to do something, you become in tune with it. You become in tune with that particular action. And when you become in tune with that particular action, by default you would want to do it. Right? It is no longer something that is forced upon you. And I advise and I appeal to our respected parents, moms and dads, if you really want to inculcate the concept of I want as opposed to I have, when the time of prayer, don't tell your children, go and pray. You drop everything and do it in front of them. Then they will value prayer. But Abbas, it's time for prayer and you're cooking mandazi, for example. You are in the kitchen doing, I don't know what, rasmalai. Drop the rasmalai. It's not more important than Salatul Dhuhr and Asr. 
Because then your son would say, oh my God, my mom dropped everything in the kitchen. Because the kitchen is like something holy. You know? It's like something very holy. Drop everything. Dad sitting watching the six o'clock news. He wants to know what's happening. Which innings is Pakistan at? And Salatul Maghrib happens. Jafar, did you pray Maghrib? Oh, you're watching innings. You're not setting an example. Drop the innings. Go pray with your son. Say, let us go and pray with your son. Stand up and pray. This is one thing. Another thing. Make sure when you go and pray, if you are able, if you're at home, for example, or at work, you have a place. Make sure you design the place of prayer as something not as something ordinary like every other place in the house don't you know there is a community i visit may allah bless them i like one thing about them the first thing they do when they purchase a property sayyidna they allocate a prayer room before anything else they have to have a prayer room and sometimes they de decorate it with zariah you know, before they allocate the bedroom to the parents or the children, no, this must go first in the house. Prayer room. Why? Because when the prayer room is designed in such a way, it takes all the distractions away. You know, that's a place of focus. Two, three, know what you are reciting. Know what you are reciting. As I said, come to know Allah through his asma and sifat. Learn some of these, you know, attributes of Allah, Rahim, Qadir, Muqtadir, Malik, you know, uh, uh, Wajid, Majid, Rahim, Rahman, you know, uh, Qadir, Muqtadir, you know, Al Alim, Al Khabir. This puts you in a completely different state of awe with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you do it. Fourthly, or thirdly, when you enter into prayer, consider it as if it is the last of your prayers the last of your prayers that this is the last thing like rasulullah taught us he said when you approach prayer approach prayer as if allah is looking at you jannah is on your right hand side hellfire is on your left hand side and you are standing on the sirat your musalla your sajdaga right should be your what Siratul Mustaqim. Imagine if all this and you are standing there, would there be any distractions? There will not be distractions. And don't approach prayer after an argument. Don't approach prayer when you are looking for something. Wallahi, you'll find it in prayer. Right? Because shaitan wants to distract you. You, ah, you lost your key. Someone said, every time I lost a key, I, I pray namaz to Allah to rakat, I find the key. I said, well, you didn't pray <laughs> until you were looking for the key. So Shaitan came to you in the prayer. He told you it's under the pillow. So now you want to finish Fatiha. So you're not going to see whether it's the key under the pillow. Allah is out of the equation after that, right? He's no longer into the equation. How is it then we're going to... Or for example, you're praying and you are worried about your you know, shares. Nasdaq going up. The FTSE going down. Forget it. You'll have a heart attack. Right? If the Nasdaq goes down or the FTSE goes down, you know, all these share markets, you know, and you have invested 100,000 or now Bitcoin. <laughs> huh? uh, Sayyidina? Uh, Bitcoin and all these coins. And you are entering prayer just going over your calculation. There is no prayer. I'm telling you from now. It's going to be Bitcoin upon Bitcoin upon Bitcoin. That's what you'll be thinking. So free your mind from this cloudiness, you know, and then into into that state of prayers and in in passing in passing this is one of the wisdom not the reason you know we spoke about two different things there is illa of hukum and there is hikmah of hukum right sayyidna al illa ghair ma'rufa al hikmah qad tu'raf illa is not known the cause and the reason why allah legislate only allah knows it the wisdom yeah we may arrive at some of the wisdom behind why allah legislated something in that way and i said why did allah for example legislate seven circumambulation around the kaaba i don't know the reason why i don't know i do it because i submit to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but the hikmah yeah it could you know help in one two three four or whatever focus and so on now to conclude on this particular point as i as i said is we need to be aware 
that when I am in a state of prayer, the one who's benefiting is me, not Allah. Huh? That's what I need to know. That I'm entering into that state for my own benefit. So imagine how much you want to take from this prayer in order to raise your rank. Because the Imam says, your prayer is accepted in as much as you are actually giving to it. How much you give to it is how much you reap in return. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa alihi wa Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Uh, Shaykh, we guide us. Can we invest within Bitcoin okay. and mm. do Muamla with that? Yes, and yes. How to calculate the home's profit as its value of actually every day? Okay. Firstly, the latest, if I'm correct, the latest opinion I heard of Sayyid Sistani, may Allah prolong his life, no. is that he, he, innahu mutawaqqif. He has not made a fatwa has not made an opinion. He said, when it comes to Bitcoin, go to another marja and see what is his opinion in the matter. And if he allows you to do so, then you take his fatwa in that. And I allow you to take the fatwa of a marja who is of similar alamiya, you know, similar knowledge and credibility within the uh, uh, body of, of, of jurisprudence in order. But Sayyid does not take a position in, in that regard. I heard also another marja, in fact, uh, in, in Qom, his name ends with a Zinjani. I don't know his full name. He, Ahsant, Ahsant. Sayyid Shubair Zinjani. He says it is not allowed. <laughs> his opinion, it is not allowed. Sayyid Shubair Zinjani in that regard. So you need first to establish whether it is allowed to invest in it or not allowed to invest in it. And then we can... Uh, Sayyidna can enlighten us about the question of homes in that regard. Uh, it's a, you can count it uh, as the other online investment, mm. uh, like the, you know, the real view of Sayyid al Sistani Hafizahullah so. about the virtual currencies and all, it's, it's still quite mutawakkir. mutawakkir. It's not saying anything about the virtual cloud investment. So you have to go to ask others and until today as for my little knowledge no one is giving detailed information mm, about that mm, yet mm. inshallah when i'll find i will update you definitely with that. definitely and one more question uh, i think two more questions i will include today i'm trying to find out more useful question yeah it's a good useful question how can I correct my parents in the religious matter? matter ahsant, ahsant, like ahsant. some of the wrong eggs in prayer of fast. Ahsant, tamam. How this is. I think one of the most difficult thing is to do is when we want to approach our parents or our elders about a religious matter, because the question of respect is of paramount importance. Huh? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَكُلْ لَهُمَا أُفٍ وَلَا تَنْهَرْهُمَا Don't chastise them or uh, rebuke them. And don't even say, say the word uf or unf. Huh? And you know, the, the linguist, Arab linguist, they said if there was a word of lesser value than of, Allah would have used it. So this would have been the least of the least of abusive word that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not even expect you to use against your parents. Not to say. Imagine then coming to your prayer and tell you, oh, your prayer is batal. La hawla wa la quwwata. World War Four will happen at the house. Or three, you know. So I think the best approach is not to say you are wrong. The best approach is to pose the question to your father about that matter that he's doing wrong so that he knows himself that what he's doing is not right. For example, the example of Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein with that Ahsan, Ahsan, they approached that person and they said to him, they knew he was doing his wudu wrong, 
But imagine if these both Ma'asum Imam come to that man and tell him at the age of 60, your, for example, your wudu is batal and ultimately, of course, your salah is batal and everything that comes with it, you know. So they came to him and said, Amma, our uncle, our dear uncle, me and my brother are doing wudu. Can you please arbitrate and tell us who is performing his wudu closer to that of the Prophet wasallam? So he said, Yalla, Bismillah, go for it. Firstly, you've given him some sort of respect. Secondly, you brought his, uh, his, uh, sorry, his knowledge into repute, good repute. You did not criticize his knowledge yet, right? Because you gave him the respect to look over his knowledge. So he said, Yalla, Bismillah, Imam Hussein, of course, performed wudu. It's a replica of the wudu of Rasulullah. Imam Hassan performed wudu. It's a replica of that of Imam Hussein. And ultimately, of course, it's the wudu of Rasulullah. By default, that man knows he's done wrong. He said, by Allah, your wudu is that of the Prophet. I am the one who doesn't know how to perform wudu. Thank you for teaching me. You know? So, if your parents are doing something wrong, Islam does not expect you to be quiet, by the way. Does not expect you to be quiet on haram. Because لا طاعة لمخلوق في معصية الخالق There should be no obedience to anyone who is disobeying Allah. But your parent may not know they are doing this act. Whether it is by wrong means or whether by intention even. Sometimes, right? Your role is to come across to your parents in a way that is firstly creative, respectful, approachable without taking their dignity and respect away from them so for example your father is for example negligent about an act in his prayer go to your dad he said dad look i i know you've been praying for so long i want to pray in front of you please correct my prayer allahu akbar he would know if you are surely knowing what your prayer is all about right good do it if after that he doesn't do it correctly or he says no 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 you don't know how to pray the best means to come to a father is through his wife hmm? uh, not you uh, father's wife stop being naughty a little bit. Uh, cheeky huh he, he, he you go to the mother tell her mom i'm concerned about my dad and i don't know how to approach him because i don't want to offend him but he's doing one, two, three. What do you think? Let her talk to him. That's another approach, right? That's another approach. A third approach is tell your dad, can we watch a video about teaching prayer? That's the best way. That sums it up. Because it's not coming from you anymore. It's coming from a reliable source. And both of you are engaged in the act. Or let say you volunteer it. Say, you know what? I'm really, really wanting to change the environment in the house. Every now and then we should watch something about our acts of worship. Change the environment. I said be creative. You know, you need creativity in religion. You know, in the way you say it or the way you teach it. One more line that we added because I know my community. Boys and girls, youth, you are the most <coughs> blessed generation I ever witnessed. Your parents were not like this. They used to have one Molana in mosque, top of the mosque, in the Mehra. They used to go just to shake hands with Molana and leave. That's it. You guys are blessed, you guys are lucky, you have madrasa, you have books, you have tablets, you have videos, you have audios, you have shapes, you have lectures, Q&A and all. None of them was used to be very easy at that time. So whatever they secure within them, it is blessing, believe me. And Alhamdulillah, you are lucky to have those parents who are still transferring to you the religion with values. So now you are able to ask this question now. Alhamdulillah. One last question, I think, and rest of the questions, inshallah, some other day. And it's again useful question, as I say. 
Sheikh, like hijab for women, as you mentioned, will increase piety and ifa for <laughs> girls and women. <laughs> Is there any such kind of hijab or covering or modesty ruling about the man's in Islam? Of course, 100%. I mean, sometimes we misconstrue the question of hijab. We think hijab is only on the part of the woman, not on the part of the man. In fact, when Allah spoke about hijab, he began with the man first. وَقُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ أَنْ يَغُضُّوا مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ Say to the believing men first, before the women, to lower their gaze. Allahu Akbar. To lower their gaze. Number one. Lowering one's gaze, all right, will safeguard you from many things in life. Because I, I said two days ago that Imam Sadiq related a hadith on the authority of Isa ibn Maryam. When al Hawariyin, the disciples, came to him and said, Arshidna ya mu'allim al khair, O one who teaches goodness. O oh, peer, peer, you say peer, peer. O oh, peer, teach us something good, advise us. He said, you are from the lineage of the Jews, from the lineage of Musa. Musa told you not to commit zina, not to commit an act of fornication. I say to you, do not even think about the act of zina. And then he said, why? Because if you let smoke inside your home and your home has beautiful furniture and ornaments, what would happen to that furniture? The disciple said, it will turn black. He said, and so when you think about fornication, your mind will become black, right? So when you expose yourself more and more towards social media and nudity, pornography and all these things, right? then you do not value that respect towards the other gender. And then you would do everything in your part in order to expose yourself more for attention. In as much as a woman is asked to dress modestly, men in Islam are also, by the way, asked to dress modestly. For example, am I allowed to come to the mosque? And I'm sorry, Sayyidina, I'm going to mention this. Coming to the mosque, with a low cut jeans, so someone knows the brand of my underwear? In sajda? Seriously? You know, you are coming to the house of Allah, wear something appropriate, right? Wear something that actually covers your body, right? If, for example, if, for example, hypothetically, I'm saying you're allowed to go out in public, you're allowed, I say, and this is questionable. Because there is a big study has been done about it. What is the least you can wear in public as a man? And the study says that I looked at, says when Allah prescribed the study, uh, sorry, prescribed the modest dress for men that they should cover, for example, certain parts in public and expose, let's say, the upper part of their body. It is because then at that time there were no women in public. Huh, Sayyidina? There were no women in public to observe them but why did Allah tell them that because mostly their work was labor work right so they can't be shackled with too much clothes so they had the bare minimum to cover their bodies in public but they were not exposed in their labor work to women looking and observing them but now we are in a community that both genders and God knows what other gender these days are as well right that we are exposing ourselves to in this world huh? so you need to re-examine the way you dress in public right so if i become an icon if, of infatuation for example if i go with a singlet and i have biceps right or i have six pack tell me say it billah alaik is this hijab for our sisters I'm going, oh, Wallah, Islam told me I can be in a singlet. Habibi, but that woman is looking at you. She may become infatuated with you. And you are causing fitna. You are causing corruption in society if you dress in that mannerism. Right? So out of respect to your sisters, right? Out of respect to the other gender, dress modestly, loose fitting, for example. Right? Look at us, Sayyid and Sheikh, three, four layers. Wallah, we dress more hijab than our sisters. Right, Sayyidina? 
We are four or five layers and we still are covering more. La hawla wa la illa. You know? So try at least to accommodate the question of modesty, not only in the way you approach an act of worship, but also in the way you approach public life. We must be modest in public life because people are onlookers. So they are looking at us in as much as, and in both situations, men and women are told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to lower their gaze. For example, if a woman does not want to dress appropriately, hypothetically, is my problem with her or my problem with me controlling my gaze? It's within me. Whether she wants to dress appropriately, appropriately or not, that's her case with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I'm also answerable to Allah because Allah spoke to me first when he said, وَقُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ أَنْ يَغُضُّوا مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ And say to the believing men first to lower their gaze and what? And guard their privacy. وَيَحْفَظُوا فُرُوجَهُمْ You know, to guard their privacy. And their privacy in this uh, in this particular ayah does not mean necessarily just the private part. It means anything that may become an act of attraction to the opposite gender. You know, the funny thing is that I never come uh, around it. Is that when someone takes his wife to the beach and she is he's taking her to, to swim. So she's swimming in a whole abaya and his holiness is in shorts. Out of respect to your wife, to your wife who is in full abaya and hijab, right? Show her some consideration to the way she's dressing, you know, instead of expose. And if she says, Look, that woman looked at you, says, I don't care, Sharia allowed me to wear shorts. Really? Really? That is not the approach, brothers and sisters. There has to be some sort of uh, uh, what we call consideration to the feelings of the other genders and especially when it comes to our wives. Wa sallallahu ala muhammad wa ali sorry Sayyidina. Jazakum Allah. We are ending with a good note to continue discussion and home. Ahsant, ahsant, ahsant. Jazakum Allah. Thank you. Jafar, you want to come to me? Ahsant. Ahsant. I have some